Hello everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Piers Harding Rolls and I work as a games industry analyst at Ampere Analysis. So the topic for today's talk is the games content subscription market and I'll be examining the market opportunity, the competitive catalogue landscape and delving into some of the characteristics of the subscription gamer. So I think, um, first off, I think it's worthwhile just setting the scene of where I think we are as a kind of industry in terms of its uh, development and the kind of disruptive wave that we're going through at the moment. And it's a kind of sort of long um, development cycle, I would say. We started off uh, with uh, various stages through which have been um, developed through sort of connectivity of different device categories, and they've allowed uh, different uh, business models to emerge. And we're now in this, I think, final stage, the sort of uh, culmination of all this development, heading towards what I would describe as a kind of on-demand consumption model. And I guess the definition of that is giving players access to content across all device categories when and where they want it. Um, and the idea is to deliver content or games to the broadest audience in the most efficient way. And if we think about that kind of consumption, we're thinking about a form of consumption which fits well within the subscription monetization model. And I think uh, that's driven the idea, this sort of catchphrase of the Netflix of games. So it's been banded around for quite a few years now. And I think when people use it, it sort of immediately conjures up comparisons with other entertainment sectors. At its most basic, it suggests access to a catalogue of content, of course, and that's you know, fairly straightforward in the context of some of the game subscription services. Obviously, Xbox Game Pass, PlayStation Now. Um, but it also um, indicates the kind of shift that we've seen in other entertainment sectors. So the way we've seen the video and the music sectors develop a much more significant shift towards subscription as the main kind of monetization model for the industry. And I think that in turn stokes a bit of fear in uh, the games studios and the developers that you know, potentially under that sort of model, they will be progressively more squeezed and the rules of monetization and engagement start to shift from what we are used to now. But actually, I think it's a pretty misleading analogy. Um, there are some similarities between the game sector and these other entertainment sectors but the games sector is fundamentally different in many ways. As many of you know, sure uh, know, most of the spending on games is on in-game monetization, primarily in free-to-play titles. So 79% of the total market opportunity in 2021 in terms of consumer spending was based on in-game monetization. That means I think it's very unlikely that we're gonna see a wholesale shift to subscription monetization. Also in the context of subscription services, there is this ability to have hybrid monetization. So in-game monetization combined with subscriptions, which means that the commercial framework for these services is very different from the framework for other entertainment subscription services. And it's not just a case of replacing, say, the premium sales with subscription sales. You know, you have this ability to monetize those subscription users in other ways as well. And that means a potentially higher ARPU in terms of, um, you know, higher ARPU ceiling in terms of the overall opportunity potentially compared to these other sectors. The other difference is that there's not much exclusive content which is available just for subscription services. I mean, there's a few examples, I think, in Apple Arcade, but generally you can't, um, if you want to get access to a game that was in 
a subscription service, you can do that uh, through other forms of monetization. So all the games in Game Pass, for example, you can buy uh, premium games outside of that. And that means the commercial framework is different for the game subscription services. It also means the drivers for content inclusion within the services vary uh, within the game space compared to the entertainment sector. And I think that ref is reflected in the sort of deals that can be done. So the, the actual acquisition of content into those services uh, from both the service provider side and from the devs, there is a uh, good deal of flexibility in the ter types of deals that can be done, I think. So if we look at um, the key drivers for adding games to subscription services. Obviously, we have the direct revenue. And I think there's, you know, a lot could be said about the different deals that can be done with different uh, platforms and services. There's a lot of variation there. It depends on, you know, what the service provider is trying to get out of it and uh, the extent of um, the willingness to provide exclusivity from, from the content owner, for, uh, for example and other uh, factors such as you know, whether it's a new launch or a new release. Obviously those, um, I guess, more um, comprehensive deals offer a bigger revenue opportunity. Uh, but for many game devs, I think that's a really tough decision to make. So we, you know, the de decision of putting your game day and date into a subscription service for an exclusive amount, period of time it's tough to make a decision if you know a decision around that. Is that uh, good commercially for me at this point in time? And I think as a result, m many of the deals that are done are really for older titles, catalog titles. Uh, they tend to be uh, the deals that have been done. The other um, drivers for adding content to these subscription services include, you know, re-establishing a franchise. If you're bringing a new game in a particular franchise out. Um, and putting an older title into a subscription service to raise the, raise the profile. There's the ability to reach a wider, a broader audience um, and potentially getting exposure to highly engaged gamers. So some of the stats that Microsoft has come out again with today, you know, talking about Gamers, subscription gamers, Xbox Game Pass gamers who are much more willing to spend on content, etc. cetera. Um, there's also this ability to boost uh, visibility and do co-marketing with uh, the service providers, potentially. And there's also a network effect to uh, consider. So if you bring in a, a significant amount of users, the network effect potentially on other platforms where your content is available and the opportunity in terms of additional premium sales might um, be boosted because of that. So talk to a little bit about why you would put your content into these services and how games is different from other entertainment subscription services. I also think it's worth just looking at the opportunity. So we've got it in perspective to understand you know, how impactful it could be on the market. So this is the North America and European games market total with the chunk that is relevant to games content subscription services. It's only 4% of the market currently. So I don't think we should, I guess, overblow the idea of the Netflix of games in the context of uh, the entire game sector. Um, and if we look at the forecast, it's, it's growing and it's going to continue to expand. Um, but I also don't see that there's going to be this very dramatic shift across to subscription monetization because of those points I made earlier talking about the, um, you know, the, the strength of in-game monetization, for example, which takes a, a massive majority of the share of spending across, across the sector. So this is uh, our estimates for market share for the leading services. Again, this is across uh, Western spend, uh, across games content subscription services for Q4 2021. 
And it's clear that Xbox Game Pass is in a dominant position. And Microsoft has um, you know, um, been very active in terms of its acquisitions, and that is driving a kind of concern that um, its pipeline will be su substantially boosted, its first party pipeline. And what are the implications for third party companies that are putting their content into that particular service? Um, and this kind of dominant position obviously exacerbates that situation. Um, I think there will be some implications potentially. So the more first party content, the bigger um, franchise, franchises that it brings into the service, obviously I think squeezes those smaller titles potentially. And if, they, if there's this significant shift towards games as a service titles, then again, I think there's a potential for it to undermine the engagement available for smaller titles in those services. Um, we, I think we had to take it into context though. This is um, an impact which could um, you know, be contained around the sort of console opportunity, so the Xbox console opportunity, and potentially have a knock-on impact on PlayStation to some degree. Um, at the moment, I think it's less relevant as the PC space and obviously the mobile space they all, you know, in terms of the wider opportunity, I don't think this is a sort of a significant amount of concern. So the success of Xbox uh, Game Pass has been driven primarily by the inclusion of um, newer releases compared to other services. Obviously, the you know sort of watershed moment was the introduction of uh, their own first party releases directly into the service, but there is a very strong correlation between the performance of Xbox Game Pass in terms of the number of subscribers it's picked up in the second half of last year and the number of day one uh, titles that have come into that uh, service. A sort of mixture of, so in blue here, that's third party titles and, and orange is first party titles. Um, and it's, it's very hard to see other services competing on this level of, of uh, willingness to financially back the service to bring in uh, certainly first party titles. So Sony's upcoming kind of reformat of its subscription services, I don't see them changing their policy for first party uh, content. Um, but potentially they may start to boost it in, in, in the context of third party new releases. But um, you know this is this is why Xbox Game Pass has been particularly successful. Um, so this is just to reinforce uh, that idea. This is PlayStation Now Age of Catalog and Xbox Game Pass Age of Catalog com compared, and you can see that Xbox Game Pass is much younger in terms of its catalog. It's got a lot more uh, fresher content and newer content compared to PlayStation Now. Obviously the positioning is, is vastly different. The success of both of those platforms, I think reflects the quality and the age of content that's in those uh, different services. And if we're thinking about how the Game Pass catalog is going to evolve, I've talked about that kind of watershed moment where first party games were placed into that service. And then progressively we've seen third party content which is higher profile, um, basically catalog content which older titles but high profile titles. And we're in this stage now where um, third party games, day one release, are going into the service. And the next stage is seeing bigger franchises of those new releases going directly into the service. So that should be, um, you know, we've already seen some interesting additions this year. I think it's just inevitable that we will see some big franchises going in. And I think the end game is this idea of sort of cloud native games. And that's when we get some sort of exclusivity, I think, for the Game Pass uh, proposition, obviously um, distributed through xCloud within Game Pass Ultimate. And I think, um, you know, that's the sort of end game it not, might not come this year, might not come next year, but it's certainly something that's with the announcements today, for example, with the idea of Azure 
and other factors, this is definitely the kind of roadmap that which they're developing towards. So we talked about the sort of main players in the market and the usual suspects, but are there opportunities for content owners outside of those? So at the moment, there's a lot of activity of cloud gaming uh, service providers in the telco space who are served by white label aggregators and cloud gaming um, um, technology companies. And there's an opportunity there, I think, to license content into those services, or it's not going to be a huge opportunity, it's a sort of incremental opportunity. And I think there's a window of opportunity to do the, these kind of deals now because the interest is really high, there's a lot of services that come to market, there's a lot of competition between services, and they are, you know, wanting content, they're competing for content. Um, so there is an opportunity there. And then obviously we have other new entrants coming into the market. Netflix is the obvious big name which has announced its uh, move into the market and it's now securing content. I think it wants to secure you know, a good batch of third party content so it can build up the portfolio. Whether it can do that under the current terms that it's offering I think is perhaps questionable. I think it may need to revisit those terms to become more competitive with the existing players. Um, so it's something to consider for them. But this, you know, Netflix's move might prompt other SVOD players to move into the market as well. So there are opportunities to pursue, but I think it's also worth looking at how competitive the kind of catalogue situation is across these subscription services. Um, first up, you know, this is just a basic number. This is the amount of distinct titles um, I think it's from December 2021, number of distinct titles across all the services that we track. And actually it's not, most services are pretty small, you know, there's sort of less than 300 titles, many are less than 200 titles. PlayStation now has a lot of legacy classic games in there that bulks out the catalog, but they are a kind of exception at, at 900 titles. And Xbox Game Pass Ultimate is around 500. Xbox Game Pass PC is less. Xbox Game Pass uh, console is, again, less. Um, but the, you, I think you, you have to sort of realize that actually there's not that much uh, content in these services at the moment. There's not a huge amount. And I think, you know, competition to get your games into those services, depending on what they, the service providers want in terms of the level of you know, maximum catalog that they hope to have. I think that's something that, um, you know, obviously impacts the ability for you to get your content into those services. And if we think about, you know, if they are expanding that much, this is the Xbox Game Pass ultimate volume of distinct titles, as we sort of define it, across the whole year. And Aside from the sort of uplift from EA Play PC being bundled into the service, it's not actually that much different from March is 500 titles, December 2021 is 515, a very small percentage, you know, a few percent increase in total volume. Possibly because they're thinking, well, do we, can we actually, is it commercially viable to have more? Is it going to become a discovery issue? All these kind of factors that come into that decision making. There is some rotation in and out of those services, obviously. Um, so overall, there were 686 distinct titles in Game Pass in 2021, but still not a massive number. And a lot of those are kind of, you know, legacy titles or titles that won't come out of the service. There's, you know, the slots are taken in effect. And if we look at the sort of activity of publishers, so this is another way we sort of slice the catalog data is to look at the uh, company activity. You can see that there is around 700 companies across these services active, many of them with sort of one, one or two titles, but there are a few which have built a more progressive amount, amount of titles that are going into the services. And you know, it does suggest that there's already a certain level of um, quite significant competition, 
to get access to those catalogues in terms of the activity of different companies. But also, you know, shows that there's a willingness to experiment and, um, you know, identify if there's a, you know, opportunity there worthwhile, incremental opportunity that's worthwhile. This is a slide which looks at the Xbox Game Pass uh, distinct games by actual publisher uh, from December 2021. And you can see the Microsoft and EA titles obviously take the most uh, sort of volume, big chunk of the share of those titles. But there is a, you know, a wide range of different publishers that are active and some, in effect, direct publishers, um, you know, um, devs that are directly publishing into um, this particular service, and I've highlighted the ones which I think are relevant to the kind of indie space, and it shows that there is a kind of small but relatively important role for um, the indie titles across those different indie publishers. Um, this is obviously not all the um, publishers that are active in that particular service, but they are um, the biggest, you know, in terms of the ones that have got multiple titles in that service. You know, the thing we have to consider is if, if Microsoft does add a lot of first-party content, which it inevitably will do with its the acquisitions that it's done, and it's looking to acquire more higher-profile sort of franchises from third parties that go into these services, whether those smaller titles, less distinct titles, or less well-known titles are uh, increasingly squeezed in terms of the kind of discovery loop. And this slide just takes a little look at the, um, you know, one of the strategies in terms of publishing um, for Devolver Digital, uh, looking at which services they're putting their games into. I think what this shows is there's been a kind of div diversification of its strategy in the context of, so it's taken some of its products out of Xbox Game Pass, or it doesn't, it's reduced its exposure to Xbox Game Pass and its willingness to kind of diversify across other uh, subscription services. So it's showing a fair amount of sophistication, I would say, uh, and that's what we're observing in terms of the strategies of different companies in this space, that they are slowly growing kind of more sophisticated strategies. Another thing that's worth looking at is the kind of complexity of the market environment. So of the services that we track, um, some of those are what we describe as kind of local telco-based services, but they all have catalogs which are relevant um, and can be sort of tracked in the context of seeing if they are overlapped with, say, the international players. This um, visualization is a tree map from our data tool, which looks at the different catalogs of services within um, Italy. So it's looking at some of the local services versus the global services and looking at the overlaps between different uh, services. And it shows already a good deal of complexity and sort of understanding where your, if you're a service company, you know, where your um, exclusives lie and how much content is really um, unique in terms of your service. But it also this kind of information, I think, gives content owners the ability to negotiate better deals to kind of take advantage of that complexity to understand uh, the landscape and see where the gaps exist within particular portfolios and where you can have the maximum impact in terms of your particular products if you're looking to put those into subscription services. So I'm going to finish up. We talked a bit there about catalogue. I'm going to finish up with some slides around uh, well, consumer research, basically, that we do to look at some of the characteristics of subscription gamers. And generally, you know, they are more active than your average gamer. So here it shows they spend 23% more time on a weekly basis playing games, uh, substantially more engaged. If we look at the average number of subscriptions per gamer, I think it's interesting, obviously, the US is the heaviest there. The other markets that we do our survey work in, you can see that there's a kind of downward trend. Um, I guess there's some thinking there in terms of your, if you're thinking of your content strategy, will 
you know, if you're if you're looking to engage an audience in specific territories, then you know whether you're putting your games into subscription services or not. You know, there's a decision to make there if you feel that it's under sort of represented in certain markets, for example. It also illustrates that there is um, significant growth potential, I think, for subscription services in these other markets where in the US it's, I wouldn't say it's mature, but it's obviously more advanced, but it gives you an idea of the kind of ceiling that could be achieved in some other Western territories, for example. We also ask consumers how they discover games, and there's um, some significant differences between um, what uh, game, I'm um, sorry, subscribers, game content subscription sus subscribers do to find their games versus your average gamer. Um, so they, subscribers look to social media, online video sites and, and games platform online stores as their kind of sources for discovering content. It's quite interesting that games platform online store is so high for a subscription service it kind of reiterates the idea that actually they're much more engaged and they're willing to spend across all kind of different content areas. Um, for the average game, a word of mouth is actually much, is at the top. So there's a significant difference in the way they discover, and that you know, might be interesting to you in terms of reaching different audiences and that would be relevant across those kind of discovery channels, I, I guess. This is looking at Game Pass subscribers, and it's looking at just some of the basic demographics. So this is the age uh, range, and you can see that the age of Game Pass, so this is a comparison of Game Pass Xbox players or Game Pass subscribers versus Xbox console gamers with no Game Pass. And you can see that it skews um, a bit older in terms of the, um, the subscribers. And I think that's because, and also they have, you know, more likely to be living with children at home. It's more sort of family oriented. Uh, in terms of the devices that they play on, they, there's varied devices. Um, so multiple devices and quite high penetration of obviously console, as you'd expect, but also smartphone, for example, which goes with the idea that Game Pass is progressively multi-screen in terms of its strategy. You can see how that uh, fits into to the, the types of uh, consumer that are using Game Pass. And I, this looks at the spend across different categories of, again, Game Pass subscribers versus Xbox console gamers with, without Game Pass. And you can see that across all categories, they tend to spend more. Um, this is not as, I guess, dramatic spend uptick as some of the data that Microsoft has released itself, it released some more data today actually looking at the spend. But it does kind of correlate and re, I guess, um, you know, from an independent source, this reiterates the idea that they are willing to be, they are more, more engaged and they're also spending more content, more on content across different forms, um, forms of um, monetization. So getting access to that audience is actually quite beneficial uh, in that context. And this slide looks at the genre taste, so the game genre taste of Game Pass subscribers versus, again, Xbox console gamers without Game Pass. And I guess some of the key differences is that there seems to be a willingness to have a more sort of varied genre taste uh, versus, um, you know, the, the average game, uh, con Xbox console user who is looking at, um, you know, is heavily into shooters, et cetera. There's less um, interest in that. There's more interest in more casual games and a sort of broader ap appeal, I think, of different games. And I think that reflects the, the family type experience, um, the family environment that the Game Pass subscribers are uh, playing games in. So just to wrap up, uh, these are a few sort of takeaways of the, of the session. I don't believe that subscriptions will become the dominant um, monetization model for the game sector as it has done progressively within the video and music sectors. Um, 
the, the fact that in-game monetization is worth su such a significant chunk of overall spending means I think it's very unlikely that that's going to shift, is going to be so significant for that to happen. Um, there are multiple reasons to add games to subscription services. We touched on quite a few of them. It's not just about direct revenue, but there's opportunities for marketing your product into services, using it as a marketing platform, engaging a broader audience, a more varied audience, an engaged audience that might be um, interested in a broader uh, collection of content. Uh, uh, the Game Pass domination of the market at the moment, I think it does potentially have some implications, but we've got to think about where, that, where those implications are going to play out. And I think that, you know, if we're thinking of the broader market, if you're just focused on Xbox as a platform, for example, cons console-based, then I think you would, you know, think about it more seriously, but the implications are more focused in where uh, Game Pass is dominant. Um, there are additional sales opportunities to take advantage of, which I think there's a window of opportunity to take uh, advantage of those sales or those commercial deals that are taking place within the cloud gaming space with telcos and local providers. But that is a window of opportunity. I'm not sure how long it's going to be open for. There's a lot of interest at the moment because of the rollout of 5G and full fiber uh, solutions. So um, it's something to consider, I think, short term. Uh, we investigate the idea of indie content and the role it plays within the different services and the importance of it. You know, the question is whether in certain services, as they become more high profile, the scale, uh, scale of those services grows and we get to a point where you know, bigger franchises are considering going into those services and there's first party content, whether you know, those smaller games get increasingly squeezed and the terms of acquiring those or putting those games into those services starts to deteriorate in some way. And we investigated subscribers to these content subscription services and how they are different to the average gamer. In fact, they're more engaged, they play more, they spend more, and they have more varied gaming tastes, means they are an interesting and certainly worthwhile group of um, consumers to get access to. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to answer a couple of questions if anyone's got. Hello, Simon. Hello. Um, yeah, I had a question about the, say, the indie publishers, and I know that Devolver put in some of its risks when it went public on AIM, that they were concerned that the upside from you know, single player indie games that don't have IAP might be diminished over time with Game Pass. Can you, can you talk to whether you think that will be an issue? Well, I think that's one of the, the, you know, one of the question marks. We, I don't think anyone really knows, but I, th I think that it's more less about um, probably um, kind of service-based games and more about the kind of franchise-based, you know, higher profile titles, and that's taking a lot of the, you know, engagement and eyeballs. The first party releases thing, I think that's one of the, the more pressing, immediate um, impacts that could be felt. And whether that's, you know, it has an impact because of the, just the awareness of certain titles and they're coming into the service, then that takes a lot of the engagement. Um, I think if you combine that with service-based games, then you're getting a, a bit of a sort of perfect storm in terms of taking a lot of the engagement away. So I think there, there is some um, concern over that, but then we've got to think, well, you know, where is this taking place? In, in the broader market, there's a much bigger broader market out there, but this is relatively contained to this particular area of the market within progressively the, the Xbox platform, but you know, in terms of it could impact, you know, the thinking around Sony's upcoming changes to its uh, subscription services and things. So it could kind of bleed over into other competitive console platforms. 
I don't think it's going to have such an impact in the PC space, although Microsoft is committed to doing you know, more PC games for Game Pass, and I think it's, you know, so it's a little bit of an unknown, but I would say that there is some concern, but we have to be kind of put it into perspective in the context of the market. Hey there. Hello. To what extent have you seen that the subscription service is actually driving the behavior of being more engaged and spending more versus the people who are more likely to spend and be engaged are also those who would sign up for a subscription service. It's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, question, isn't it? Um, I think it, there is it's probably a bit of both. So you, you, the most engaged people are happy to try out, be the first early adopters or whatever. But we're now at a phase, if, if you're looking at Game Pass, they've got 25 million subscriptions. Um, there's no doubt that those people that may have signed up to that, even in a sort of family setting, they're willing to try more content and try different varied content and try games that they wouldn't have tried before. Um, so it's probably a, a little bit of a mixture of both, but I would say that you know it's legitimate on both on both of those kind of characteristics. Um, gotcha. Thank you. No problem. As a game developer, what's the right way to weigh the financial opportunity of doing an exclusive with like a game subscription service as opposed to traditional publishing? That's a good question. I think it's a very hard decision to make um, because it obviously it depends on what you feel you can do as a company for your particular product and the terms that you're being offered. And I think the terms are, you know, realistically, they're probably going to become for, well, certainly smaller developers, they're going to come under pressure. Um, I mean, there's, you know, within specific um, services, I think. Um, and it's, it's down to what the service provider is trying to achieve as well. My so, assumption is that the financial incentives will be less, but the exposure greater. Is that the right way to view it? Sorry, can you repeat that? That the exposure is going to be wider, but the financial return is probably going to be lower for that specific game? Well, I think if you take, you know, Xbox Game Pass as an example, they have their own, you know, their own content a significantly expanding pipeline. They, I think that strategy is to rely less on paying huge sums to get third party content into there. Um, so I think it's inevitable that there will not be as, the terms won't be as good and the, and the deals will be, you know, will be, will probably reduce to an extent, but maybe not in the sort of near to, maybe not over the next 12, 24 months, because they're still relying on that third party content. And also there's this push, you know, I think Microsoft's doing a push into the PC space. Um, so it, it, it depends on what they're trying to achieve and what platforms they're trying to achieve it on. Um, and um, so there's, there's lots of variables, I would say, in it. The thing is, it's not, the risk is it's not, you know, it's not, it's not standardized, I would say. It's not standardized across different services. Not, it can change over time. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that, that's where one of the significant risks is. And if you're developing a thing with the idea, okay, you know, I'm going to push it into the, one of these services that's, you, the, the terms that you negotiate, you know, they may be different in, in sort of 12, 18 months time from, from when you thought, that, you know, you'd heard what the terms were previously, you know. So I think there's, there's some risk involved there. Okay, thanks. Any other queries? Just one, one quick question. Right. Um, curious your thoughts about how the emergence of game streaming is going to impact the growth of subscriptions over the next several years. Uh, I see, uh, game streaming is, is a kind of incremental distribution opportunity, I would say. Um, it, re it depends a lot on... So the, the biggest services are those services which use both download and streaming to an extent. Um, so they, but those services are majority download at the moment. And um, there's, a, there's obviously the, the expansion strategy is to use streaming to reach audiences that they haven't reached before. But that depends on the type of product offering they put together and the sort of price points and stuff. In, in certainly in mobile first markets, for example, and interesting um, you know, opportunities, say for example in India, I don't know, or 
um, Latin America or other Asian, Southeast Asia, you know, where there's um, a kind of mobile first opportunity. You have to think about whether there's going to be um, a sort of commercially viable strategy for packaging together something at a lower price point that's only specifically for mobile platforms, for example, for Game Pass. Um, oh, great, thanks. No problem. I think we're sort of running out of time. And anyway, I think that was possibly the last question. But I'm, ha I'm happy to chat with anyone who wants to chat. And thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you.